This is Manny Arango. He's married to Tia. They've got a little boy since they, he was with us last time, and he's moved to Texas. Would you give Manny Arango a warm New Hope welcome as he comes to bring the word to us today? Oh, thank you so much. I love Anybody grateful for Jesus today? Come on. I'm glad that you would clap for me. I'm glad that you would like shout for me. But come on, all across America, all across the world, you know what's happening today? Imperfect people like me are talking about a perfect Jesus. Come on. Broken people like me are talking about a consistent God who's never failed. Anybody grateful that, come on, when men and women fail or falter, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So seriously, I'm honored that you would clap as I would take the stage. But can we give God a hand clap of praise all over the room? He's kept you. He's kept you in your right mind. He's been consistent. He's been a provider. His presence is in the room. And the Bible says where two or three are gathered in what? His name, there he is. Come on, if he's in the room, that means joy's in the room, peace is in the room, provision is in the room, and I'm excited to be with you guys. Uh, anybody remember me from last year? Anybody, come on, you remember me from last year? Awesome, we're family. Uh, and uh, last year, I think my wife was pregnant. Uh, for those of you who may not know, me and my wife walked through five years of infertility. Uh, doctors told us it was going to be impossible for us to have children, and then we miraculously got pregnant. How many people know doctors only know the facts, they don't know the truth? I need a good amen right there. Come on, they only know the facts. They don't know the truth. They know the facts that, you, you know, the cholesterol is high or, or there is cancer. They don't know the truth. The truth is that God's a healer. The truth is that God knit you together in your mother's womb. The truth is that God is a great physician. The truth is that God can do the miraculous. All the doctors know is the facts. Come on, they don't know the truth. Come on, same with the loan officer. I need a good amen. The loan officer only knows the facts. They know your credit score, they know how much money you got saved up, they know the interest rate, all they know is the facts. The truth is that God can take two fish and five loaves and feed a multitude. The truth is that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. Come on, don't ever get discouraged by the facts. Because the facts are only part of the picture. The reality is that you don't even know the full picture until you add God's truth to man's Facts. And I think faith doesn't deny facts. Faith isn't afraid of facts. Come on, I know a lot of Christians who, you know, they think they're being spiritual and they don't want to know the facts. Oh no, we look the facts in the face and we say, no, but that's not the whole story. God is the one who knows the full picture and the whole story. And come on, I need a good amen in church. Amen. I'm black if you haven't noticed. Uh, which means you got to holler back at me, okay? I'm used to preaching at black churches, and uh, black ain't a color. It's, it's how you feel. So uh, I need everybody to feel real black all week, okay? That means you need to say amen, and you got to engage. You got to be vocal. Why? Because the power of life and death is in your tongue, okay? So uh, uh, I think we got a picture of my son. That's my son. Oh, man, that is me holding my son in church a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think we got a picture of the whole fam. That's me and my wife and my little, my little son. He's 10 months old right now. Um, and uh, you guys are family. I can be really vulnerable with you guys. Seven years ago now, when we went to the doctor for the first time, they alerted us to the fact that I had zero sperm cells. I had no sperm. Not only a low sperm count, but none. If you don't know what sperm is, you can Google it after church. <laughs> um, None, zero, zilch, uh, I, I had none. And I remember it felt like a death sentence. It felt like it was so final. And uh, you're looking at a man with no sperm who held his son in my arms before I left for Iowa. So God can do anything. I don't know whose faith needs to be encouraged today. God can do anything. He's the God of the miraculous. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. The same God that split the Red Sea, he's in the room today. The same God that took two fish and five loaves and fed them all to. That's the God that's in the room today. The God that opened up blinded eyes and unstopped deaf ears in the Bible, that's the God that's in the room today. And so, come on, we activate our faith. Amen? Amen? Come on, who's got a Bible? Who's got a Bible? And uh, go ahead, wave your Bible at me. If you got a physical Bible, come on, leather, 
and paper and ink. There we go. All my AP honors Christians with physical Bibles. Great. Who's got a device? Who's got a device? I've got both today. Come on. I've got my physical Bible plus I got my iPad. If you got a device, go ahead. Turn your Bible on or open it to Genesis chapter 29. Uh, and while we're grabbing the passage of scripture, anybody love uh, the, the Hill family? Anybody love your pastors? Come on. I love your whole family. Um, thank God for awesome leadership. Any, anybody love Pastor Weaver? Um, I'm super excited to be with you guys today. And uh, we're going to have a good time. And uh, I'm going to let you know this right out the gate. I'm preaching part one of this sermon this morning. And I will preach part two of this sermon tonight. So if you were on the fence about whether or not you are going to come to church tonight, you will not get the full message until you come to church tonight, okay? So we're preaching part one for the morning services. I'll preach part two of this sermon tonight. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we're going to start reading in verse 21. We've got the scriptures up on the screen, and we're going to do a little uh, fill in the blank. Okay? If there's a word that I don't say, that means it's your turn to say the word that I do not say. Okay? Then Jacob said to? Oh, that was like 40% of us. Come on, come on, come on. Then Jacob said to? Give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. Not necessarily what I would say to my father-in-law. But hey, I ain't judging you, Jacob, okay? <laughs> so Laban brought together all the? Of the? And gave a feast. But when evening came, this is important, okay? That Laban waits until evening comes. When evening came, he took his daughter and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Now, this is a problem because Jacob has worked for seven years, not for Leah, but for Leah's sister named Rachel, oh, come on, we got some Bible nerds in the room. That's good. Come on, Jacob has worked for seven years because he's in love with this woman named Rachel. He is infatuated with Rachel. Rachel is attractive. Rachel is beautiful. Rachel is his type. And he has worked for seven years, and he, he's excited to finally be with his girl, Rachel. And the Bible says that Laban tricks Jacob. This is important that Laban waits until evening because there's no electricity. Hello. Thomas Edison had not invented the light bulb. When it was dark, it was just dark. Okay? And he waits till evening. He, Leah gets married with a veil on, which is what, a, what would have been custom. And then they, they consummate this marriage to the sexual act. And now it, it says this uh, in, in the next verse. Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her tenant. When morning came, there was... Woo! That's a bad morning. It's a rough morning, you know what I'm saying? That morning's not getting off to a good start. And I don't know, can, can, we, can we just speak plainly for a second? Can we speak plainly? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this section of the room, I'll speak plainly to y'all. Uh, um, has anybody ever felt like, man, this is the worst day of my life? Like, come on, for Jacob, this gotta be like a bad day. Like, ranking the days, right? Like, this is a rough day. I worked seven years for a woman that I'm already in love with, I'm already attracted to, and now, not only is it a different woman, but, like, you know you're not cute when the Bible says you're not cute. <laughs> That's a whole nother level of not cute, you know what I'm saying? It's one thing for, like, you know, let's say me and Zach are trying to give some guy dating advice, and we're like, eh, that girl's not really that cute. You know, that's one thing. It's a whole nother thing for Moses to be led under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writing Genesis and the Holy Spirit go, hey, remember, remember to tell him, Leah's got a lazy eye. You know, that's a whole, like, <laughs> it's just a whole nother level of not cute, okay? And, and if you're like me, if you're like me, if you're like most humans, the moment something terrible happens, the moment something devastating happens, there are three things that you could attribute the reason for. Number one, Come on, this is the devil. No, just me. I'm the only one that's ever thought this is the devil. One time I was in a church, and the, the sound, you know, was not good. And there was a deacon that was like, we rebuke the sound demon. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I don't know if there's a sound demon. I think maybe you got some frequency problems. Come on, don't act like you've never blamed the devil for stuff. Come on, this is the devil. Number two, I think this is where a lot of us maybe have fit in. This is my fault. Come on, Jacob deceived who? His brother. Has anybody ever thought to themselves, I'm just reaping what I sowed? 
Come on, this is bad karma. Like, I deceived my brother Esau, and now Laban has what? Deceived me. Has anybody ever attributed the bad things that are happening into your life because there's some latent guilt that's been built up over time? And then, come on, number three. I wish this was number one, but for a lot of us, it's number three. God is working behind the scenes in a mysterious way. Come on, hopefully, if you're a mature believer, you get to the place where you really do believe God is up to something. And can I tell you something? A lot of us, we don't know whether it's the devil. We don't know whether it's our past sins. And we don't know whether or not God is working. But here's what we do know, that God works all things together. That sometimes it could be the enemy, it could be your sin, and God still decides, I'm going to add my grace to all of the earthly and supernatural issues that are going on. Because here's what I'll tell you. I'll get to the end of the story that this woman, Laban, deceives Jacob. He marries this woman named Leah, and Leah's fourth son, mm, son number four, is a man by the name of Judah. And if you keep reading in your Bible and you read them boring sections called the genealogy, you will learn that Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. If there was never a man named Laban that tricked Jacob to marry Leah, there would have never been a man named Judah. And if it wasn't for Judah, there would never be Jesus. Do you know that God can use all of the messages up scenarios that happen in your life if you think that God cannot undo whatever the enemy has tried to do or whatever your sin has caused in your life you have placed God in a box but we declare today that even if you've messed up even if you did deceive your brother and even if Laban did deceive you that what man means for evil God can turn it around for good that's a good place to say amen in church Come on, anybody ever lost sleep over whether or not it was the devil, your sin, or God? Come on, am I the only one? Anybody ever stayed up late deliberating? I don't know if it's God. I don't know if it's the devil. I don't know if it's my sin. Can I help you? I want to set you free today. You don't know. It could be all three, and it doesn't matter. God is saying, maybe it is your sin. My grace is sufficient for your weaknesses. Come on, maybe it is somebody that did something evil to you. Guess what? God, Jacob, J Joseph says to his brothers, what y'all meant for evil, God turned it around for my good. Come on, we, we keep reading. We just read the Bible. When morning came, there was... So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to? I served you for? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter and marry before the older one. Bro, you should have told me that. <laughs> you could have told me that a month ago. You could have told me that yesterday. <laughs> Come on, let's keep reading. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one. Come on, you're reading with me, right? in return for another seven years. Whoo, he getting all the years. And Jacob did so, he finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him the daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his servant, to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Now, I need you to get this one. Jacob made love to Rachel also in his, his what? His love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. His love for who? His love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And I came, I came to preach to you today because for a lot of us, that's also true in our lives. There's a Rachel in your life that is beautiful on the outside. There's a Rachel, that, I don't know what Rachel signifies. For some of us, it's a friendship. For some of us, it's a relationship. For some of us, as I'm going to tell you in a minute, it, it could be a, an inanimate object that Rachel is attractive, she's beautiful, but she's barren, and she's not fruitful, and she's empty on the inside, although she is beautiful on the outside, whereas Leah, uh-oh, ain't as cute, not as beautiful, not as attractive, but baby, Simeon, Reuben, Levi, Judah, homegirl is fruitful. I wonder if there's anybody who's ever been frustrated with a relationship that is attractive on the outside but not fruitful on the inside. And for a lot of us, we have this fork in the road where we have to decide whether or not we're going to love what is beautiful or love what is fruitful. I can feel the discomfort in the room. 
Because for a lot of us, we are in love with things that signify, that symbolize Rachel. In love with stuff that looks really good on the outside, but bears no fruit. And then God typically offers us stuff. Not attractive, but it's going to be really fruitful for us, like a prayer life. Not attractive, really fruitful. Fasting, not attractive, really fruitful. Uh-oh, confrontation, not attractive, really fruitful. So let's talk about Rachel. Come on, you ready? Are we black? Come on. Are you ready? All right, there we go. Come on. There's not a library. This is a sanctuary. Come on, let's go. No need to stay quiet. Come on. Let's talk about Rachel. If you fast forward the story, Rachel steals her father's household gods. Why would you be stealing household gods if you're not an idol worshiper? So Rachel's an idol worshiper. Number two, when Laban comes out to find the household gods, Rachel puts the household gods on the camel. She sits on top of the camel and she lies. Anybody remember the lie that she says to her father Laban? She says, you can't check the camel because I'm on my period. The Bible's entertaining. If you think the Bible's boring, you're reading the wrong book. This woman's lying about her period and stealing household gods. So she's an idol worshiper and a liar. Every single time they can't get pregnant, Rachel blames Jacob. Well, and Jacob finally has to say, well, is it my fault that God don't let you have babies? And so Rachel is beautiful, but emotionally manipulative. Beautiful, but an idol worshiper. Beautiful. Oh, she's gorgeous for all the millennials in the room. She's a baddie. The problem is she's also bad for Jacob. Then you got this other sister, Leah. Not as cute, but man, Leah's so fruitful. You want to know, for a lot of us, we struggle with choosing what's fruitful versus choosing what's attractive. Our hearts are prone towards loving Rachel more than we love Leah. But really, when you're wise, you want to know what happens? You begin to see the real beauty in Leah. You begin to realize that although other people may not find Leah beautiful, she's not toxic, she doesn't complain, oh man, she's got a good attitude, that it's the fruitful stuff in life that actually makes marriages work, that makes relationships work. I, 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 let's skip to Genesis chapter 49, because I think that there are some, some wiser saints in the room, hello, that are going to love Genesis chapter 49 because Jacob is a young man in Genesis chapter 29, but then 20 chapters of the Bible go forward and decades of Jacob's life move forward. And at the end of his life, he's giving instructions to his sons on where to bury him, how to bury him. It's like a last will and testament. And Jacob's got some details, ooh, a little nerdy detail that I think is really, really important. It says this in Genesis chapter 49 in verse 29 is where we're going to start reading. It says, then Jacob gave them these I'm about to be gathered to my, bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre and Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. Here's a little, here's a little part, come on, stick with me. Verse 31, there Abraham and his wife were buried. There Isaac and his wife were buried. Oh boy. And there I buried who? Who? By the end of his life. Do you want to know who Jacob wanted to spend eternity with? Do you want to know who Jacob wanted to be buried next to? Do you want to know the instructions? She's very, very clear. Do not bury me with Rachel. Do you want to know what happens when Rachel dies? Toxic, idol worshiping, lying, manipulative Rachel. When she dies, she gets buried in the middle of nowhere in an unmarked grave. When Leah dies, they troop her body all the way back to the ancestral burial place, and they bury her with Abraham, they bury her with Isaac, they bury her with Sarah, they bury her with Rebecca, because Jacob is clear at the end of his life, he values something different than he values at the beginning of his life. Do you want to know something? What you're attracted to when you're saved versus what you're attracted to when you're not saved are very, very different. What you're attracted to when you're healthy versus what you're attracted to when you're not healthy are very, very different. There are some of us you think you're in love, but you've just trauma bonded with somebody who is your, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. 
All you've done is you've fallen in love with someone in your youth because you, you, you've attracted to them based on what's broken in them matches what's broken in you. And by the end of Jacob's life, he is wise enough and mature enough to realize that Leah is the best thing that ever happened to me. I wonder if there's anybody in church today who can testify that there are some things you would not have chosen for yourself, but thank God that God sent a Laban into your life to trick you into the very thing that brought blessing into your life and brought increase into your life. I wonder if there's anyone who can say, man, I, I, I did not want to be a preacher. I did not want to be a pastor. This is not the life that I would have chosen for myself, but God was in control. I wonder if there's anybody who's got the testimony that at some point, God took over the steering wheel of your life and put a Leah in your life. And you couldn't see that Leah was beautiful, but God knew that Leah was gonna be fruitful for you. Come on. If we are going to be people who prioritize fruitfulness over attraction, then we gotta be good with seed. Let me tell this story real quick before we get into seed, because I got five, five forms of seed that everybody has. Come on, five forms of seed that everybody has. Uh, let, let me tell this story. It's funny. Me and my wife, uh, we were believing God for children, and God, you know, challenged me. Said, well, you believe in God for babies. Why do you live in an 800-square-foot apartment? I was like, well, Holy Spirit, that's kind of rude. <laughs> Holy Spirit was like, this apartment is cute, but if you're believing God for something, then that means you need to stretch out your tent pegs. And God said, I, I didn't make the whales and then think to myself, oh, I don't have a place to put these. No, I made the ocean first, then made the whales. I didn't make birds and then think to myself, I have nowhere to put these. No, I made the sky first because God always forms first, then fills. So if you want God to fill something, you may as well start forming something. So me and my wife decided, man, it's really hypocritical of us to be complaining that we don't have children, but we don't live in, an, uh, uh, we don't live in a home that can facilitate the proper care of children. So me and my wife went on this whole journey to buy a house. And I grew up in the hood, okay? Come on, everybody say hood. Manny grew up in the hood, okay? My dad was in prison for 18 years. My dad was on drugs for a long time. My mom was pregnant by the age of 13. I grew up in the hood, okay? The projects. I don't know if Des Moines got projects, but where I grew up, there was some projects, okay? Grew up in the hood. And so my realtor, I had one rule for my realtor. I don't want to live in the... Come on, I got hood PTSD. It's like, bruh, I didn't go to college. I got a master's degree. I'm in a doctoral program. Okay, I am the first Orango to get out of the hood. I ain't going back to it. Y'all can clap for that. That's a good thing to clap for. Because God breaks generational curses. I was like, nah, we ain't going back to the hood. So my, my realtor gave me a house. He was like, I think you're going to be interested in this house. On the way to the house, I ran over like 15 potholes. I saw a couple crackheads on the street. I was like, oh boy, Jesse. Uh-oh, buddy. You didn't understand the assignment. I, roll, I didn't even get out in my car to see the house. I just rolled down my window. I was like, hey, bro, this is the hood. And Jesse's like, no, this isn't the hood. This is a, a, a upwardly moving neighborhood. You know? And then he actually said, this is a gentrifying neighborhood. I was like, Jesse, I don't care what it is. This is the hood. Don't want to live in the hood. I had about two months before my lease was over, about... You know, I was like, nope, I'm getting back in my car. Jesse sent me some more houses. About two weeks before my lease was over, I was desperate. And Jesse's a smart realtor. He said, hey, instead of meeting me at the place this time, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to drive you to the house. He drives me to the house. And we drove in such a circuitous route that I did not realize he was driving me to the hood. <laughs> he showed me a house one block away from the house that I said I would never live in. He, I was like, this is a cul-de-sac, Jesse. Cul-de-sac is key word for it. This ain't the hood. This is a cul-de-sac. I was like, when was this house built? He was like, the house was built in 2018. I said, this is new. He was like, yeah, man, only one person's ever owned this house. We should put an offer in on this house. I put an offer in on the house. My offer got accepted. And then I realized that Laban had tricked me. I realized that Laban tricked me into buying a house in a neighborhood that I did not want to live in. But you want to know what happened? Two years and two months went by, and it was finally time to sell that house. 
And when I sold that house, I made over $100,000 in a day selling that house because there was someone in my life that made me choose Leah when I wanted to be with Rachel. I wanted to be in a house that was attractive so that people could come over and be impressed. But there was someone who did not care about my ego. They did not care about the vain things that I cared about. They were a Laban in my life. And can I tell you something? That sometimes God will send someone into your life to trick you into being with the exact person or the exact thing that you actually need to be with even though you don't want to be with them. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all are responding. Oh, I'm preaching way better than y'all are responding. For some of y'all, uh-oh, I'm about to step on some toes. For some of us, that's why you're still single. Uh-oh. I don't know, I think I can do better than her, Pastor Jeff. Really? Bro, you're 45 and still single. I'm not saying you can't do better than her. I'm just saying you haven't yet. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, there's an amazing person that you could be with, but you're so arrogant that you think you deserve better than that person. And maybe if you took, got a slice of humble pie, you'd realize that this is the best person that you could ever imagine being with and that sometimes God places, come on, Leah's in our lives. And the question is this, can I love Leah more than I love Rachel? Because by the end of Jacob's life, oh, he starts out as a young man loving Rachel. By the end of his life, he's like, bury me with Leah. Because Leah don't, Leah ain't toxic, Leah don't lie. I like Leah. Come on, let's keep going. There's five seeds that everyone needs to manage if they're gonna be, come on, fruitful. Come on, we're gonna make the decision. Instead of being, instead of choosing what's attractive, we're gonna choose what's, come on, instead of choosing what's beautiful, we're gonna choose what's, come on, we're gonna prioritize fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Do your friendships look like Rachel or Leah? Come on, does your business look like Rachel or Leah? Does your vocational decisions look like Rachel or Leah? And if we're going to choose Leah, it means that we're gonna prioritize, what's the word? Fruitfulness. So let's talk about seed, because you can't be fruitful in mismanaged seed. And there's five seeds that everyone has. Key word here is everyone. Everybody say seed. seed. Come on, you have the seeds to get the life that you want. The temptation of the enemy is to make you focus on the seeds that somebody else has and neglect the seeds that you have. You have the same seed as that person. The difference is what you do with seed. And every single person has these five seeds. Come on, number one. Everybody ready? Oh, that's 40% of us. Everybody ready? Yeah. Come on, number one. First seed that everybody has is words. Words, words. I was a youth pastor for about 10 years. And, um, you know, teenagers would come to the youth group and uh, there'd be a guy and a girl that was in the youth group. And, I, you know, I like to embarrass kids and that's always fun. And so every time they would, I'd see the same guy and girl together for a couple of weeks and I'd say, hey, is this your boyfriend? Like really loud, right? Is this your boyfriend? Is this your girlfriend? And teenagers would get all annoyed and they, they inevitably say these words, no, Pastor Manny, we're just talking. And I would look at teenagers and say, hey, there's no such thing as just talking. You know, talking's the most intimate thing you can do with somebody. And I'm like, what's a really creative way I can say this at New Hope? What's a way that everybody would understand? Ah, there we go. Here's how I'll say it. Eve and the serpent were just talking. Just talking. Samson and Delilah were just talking. The Bible never says they had sex. Never. The Bible never says that there's a sexual relationship between them. You want to know how Samson lost the anointing on his life? By oversharing by talking too much, by telling her something that should have been safeguarded. The first seed that everybody has is words. God does not look at the darkness in Genesis chapter one and say to himself, O-M-E. You get it, O-M-E? You, you like that, yeah? For some of you, you'll get it tomorrow. You'll get it tomorrow. He doesn't look at the darkness and say, O-M-E, it's dark. No, if he had said the word dark, it would have gotten darker. God looks at darkness and he says, let there be light. 
Come on, the whole five years that me and my wife struggled with infertility, I never said the words, we're infertile. Why would I say those words? Can, can, can I help you? For some of us, you're in hard circumstances and your words are only making the circumstance you're in worse. Well, I need to get it off my chest. No, you need to have discipline. You have discipline over the words you speak. For me and my wife have been married for eight years, not, not 33, just eight years. We'll catch up with y'all one day. We've been married for eight years. And you know, sometimes we counsel young married couples. And I listen to the words that they say to each other. And I go, whoa, you realize that every word you say to your spouse, you're going to have to reap the words you sow. How dare you say you always and you never. You don't ever say the words always and never in marriage. That's crazy talk. Why would you say that? You're prophesying your future into existence. Your words are seed. One time I was at a barber shop and I had a nice barber. He was really good at cutting my hair. He was awesome. But he kept gossiping about his wife. And I, gave him, I told him one time, hey, man, I'm not here to hear your drama with your wife. Just cut my hair and be quiet. I'm really confrontational. <laughs> and then, you know, second time I gave him a warning. And then after that, I never showed up again. You know why? Because I care more about my soul than I care about my haircut. You know what a lot of us have? Number one, we're not good with the words we speak. But then number two, we allow, uh-oh, unqualified people to sow seed into the soil of our heart. Because seed, words are seeds. Oh, come on, we can preach faith to you all year long. But if you let your uncle who doesn't believe in tithing, who's been church hurt for 25 years, tell you, now nah, I don't believe in giving money to no church. Guess what? You just let your uncle sow seed into your life when the pastor should be the one sowing seed into your life. Can I go deeper? For some of us, that secretary who keeps complimenting you, you're so handsome, are you, are you losing weight? Guess what? That secretary keeps sowing the seeds of compliments into your ear, you're eventually gonna reap the harvest of attraction. Uh-oh. It's better to say, please stop complimenting me, and to let your wife become the dominant seed sower into your life, than to risk having someone talk you into temptation. Words, you create your world with your words, the words you speak. We live in a world right now where there's violence, but as Christians, what do we say? We say, let the kingdom of God come. Let there be peace. We live in a world that's anxious. What do we say? We say, let there be the peace of God that rests on the world. Come on, to every person that walked into church today feeling depressed, we're not saying you are depressed. We would never speak that over your life. What are we declaring? That the joy of the Lord is gonna be your strength because we take every thought captive. We speak the right words because the world that we live in is going to be a result of the words we speak you have the power of life and death in your tongue what do you say about your kids what do you say about your spouse what do you say about your city you can't be surprised when things when you're reaping the words that you've sown come on number two everybody ready for number two you sure come on number two the Bible says those who sow in tears will reap in joy. That means tears are a form of what? Seed. Your tears, form of seed. Once I was at a youth conference, well, actually, I'll tell you two youth conference moments. The, fir the first moment is back to, to, to words. This girl came up to me and she said, I'm just struggling with my anxiety. I said, did you just call it your anxiety? You just use a possessive pronoun to talk about something that you don't want. Hey, the power of life and death is in your tongue. Stop calling it yours. Let's start there. You can't be confused that this stray dog keeps coming to your house and you feed it every day. Go figure. Of course you're anxious. You just called it your anxiety. You just claimed this is mine. And then you're confused as to why you have it. Ah, uh, you claimed it. I was at a youth conference recently, and this girl comes up, she's crying. 
Pastor Manny, I just love my boyfriend, and I've tried to break up with him multiple times, and he's not a Christian, and I just can't. I can't break up with him. I love him too much. And I went, whoa, you're double sowing. You're sowing words and tears. Of course you can't break up with him. You keep sowing tears into the situation. When's the last time you cried over lost people? When's the time, last time you cried in the presence of God? When's the last time you cried over something that God cares about? When's the last time you sowed the seed of tears into something that's actually going to reap a harvest for you? 30, 60, and 100 fold. Of course you can't break up with this guy. Well, I'm just venting. I need to be honest. No! Who told you that? The Bible didn't tell you that. The secular society we lived in told you that. Told you to be authentic. The Bible says be transformed, not be authentic. The Bible says confess. Confess is I say what God has already said about me. Confess means I'm the head only and not the tail. I'm above only and never beneath. I can do all things through Christ who lives in me. And greater is he that's in me than he that's within the world. My confession comes from scripture. My confession doesn't come from how I feel. Tears. Can I challenge you? Maybe you're reaping stuff in your life because of the things you've allowed yourself to cry over. Here's a real gangster thing that God says in the Bible. I love when God says like gangster stuff. He says to Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul? I've rejected him as king. And what God is saying, hey, hey, the stuff that I've taken out of your life, the stuff that I've rejected, why are you crying over it? Hashtag Beyonce. She said, I finally found the good and goodbye. Come on, when you get God's perspective, you realize, although I call that person my best friend, they didn't have my destiny in mind. And so God removed that person from my life and God brought Aaliyah into my life. And I'm not gonna mourn over the people that God took away and I am gonna rejoice over the people that God has brought into my life because God is smarter than me and wiser than me and has a greater perspective than me. Come on, your tears is seed. I was being really macho. I thought I was being really masculine. Me and my wife had been struggling with infertility for about two years, and I'd never cried about the problem, about the issue. I remember one day, maybe two, two and a half years in, and I just broke. I remember sitting there with my wife, and I just said, I just want to be a dad, and I just couldn't stop crying. And my wife said, I didn't even know that you cared this much. You want to know something? I thought I had to be strong for her. Society had told me that in order to be a real man, in order to be masculine, I couldn't cry about it. You want to know the most productive thing I could ever do was to sow the, te the seed of tears into my son's life. I wouldn't have a kid right now had the levees not broken. I actually began to emote. No, as men, we don't just love God with our minds. We love God with our hearts. And there are some times where you're in your prayer closet and you've got to begin to shed some tears over the things that what? Break God's heart. God cares about you having godly offspring. So if God cares, oh yeah, then I get to care. But I don't just get to care about stuff that God doesn't care about and try to add him to the mix when it's frivolous anyway and it's fruitless and it's vain. Okay, everybody ready for number three? Come on, that's my last one. And guess what? I had five. Which means you're gonna have to come back tonight. You see how I did that? Yeah, come on to be continued. I'll give you the last one. You got to get the la you got to get the last two tonight when you come back at church. Come on, number 3. Yourself. Yourself. Jesus says these words in John chapter 12. He says these words. If a single seed fails to fall to the ground and die, it'll only remain what? A single seed. But if a seed what falls to the ground and dies, it'll produce many seeds. Do you wanna know why there are millions of Christians worshiping Jesus all around the globe today? Millions of people with hope and peace and new life coming and spurring up in them is because one man didn't decide to keep his life but decided to give his life away. And there he produces a model for us to follow. Jesus says in John chapter 12, as he's talking about seed, he says anyone who loves their life, what, will lose it. But anyone who what? Gives their life away. You want to know the invitation that God has for all of us? 
to take up your cross, and to follow him, to sow yourself. My dad was in prison for 18 years. Like I told you, my dad was on drugs for most of my life. You want to know what I had to do so that my son could be born into a healthy, whole, functional Christian family? I had to die to myself. Yeah, I was born with a proclivity towards addiction, but I had to die to myself. That's why as the church, we don't care how someone's born the first time they're born. Well, I'm born this or I'm born that. That's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, I'm inviting you to what? Be born again. You can always be born again. I was born with a taste in my mouth for drugs. And God said, I need you to what? Be born again. Because you can't blame me for your sin based on how you were born the first time. Oh, I'm preaching. We live in a world that thinks they have an out because of how they were born. And God goes, yeah, right. I'm not asking you to live your best life. Nope, I'm asking you to die to yourself so that new life can be deposited in you. You wanna know what your church needs, what your community needs? For you to die. Die to yourself. Your, your family doesn't just need your attention, they need you. Your church doesn't just need your money. Your church needs, come on, you, all of you. Not a part of you, not a compartmentalized version of you, no, no, no you and when we give of ourselves, ah oh, we're the most like jesus we're the most like jesus maybe you're in the room today and and that just reminded you that jesus gave his life so that you could have life he would have probably loved to live until he was 70 80 years old <laughs> 33 years on this earth and he decided to what give of his life so that we could have hope and joy and peace with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, maybe you're in this room and you're far from God right now. You don't know Jesus, but you wanna walk in a relationship with Jesus. And you're compelled by this human that gave his life for you. Can I tell you something, friend? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No guilt, no shame. Doesn't matter what you've done, Jesus says, I gave my life so that you could have life. And if you're in the room, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but you want to. You want this to be the first day of the rest of your life. Or maybe you haven't walked with the Lord in a very long time, but for some reason you're in church today. You want to make today special. You want to dedicate your life to Jesus. Can you just raise your hand wherever you are? Come on, raise your hand wherever you are. I see your hand. I see your hand. God sees your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Come on, just wave your hand at me. Just wave your I see your hand. I see your hand. You want to dedicate your life to Jesus. Church, I don't want to single anybody out, so I want us all to pray this together. Come on. Jesus. Come on, just repeat after me. Jesus, I accept you as Lord of my life. I give you control. I belong to you. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord, that you died for me, and that you're coming back to judge the living and the dead. And I, come on, and I am a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come from this day forward. Oh, come on, friend. There's a couple people in here that just prayed that prayer for the first time or for the first time in a long time. And we've declared they're new in Christ. Come on, I wanna pray for Christians real quick before we dismiss, just wanna pray for Christians. If you're in the room and you're a believer but you've been choosing Rachel over Leah, choosing those things that are attractive over the things that are fruitful, you just raise your hand. You're like, you, you're kinda of convicting me, Pastor Manny. I've prioritized things in my life that look good but that aren't good. And maybe you're in here today and you're saying, you know what? I need to take better control over my words. Because God, wave at me. I want to know who I'm praying for. Come on, the seed of words. I need to take better control over the things I say. Can't let people gossip around me. People's words have really impacted me. I got to put a fence up around my garden, <laughs> the garden of my soul. Come on, who's in here? You've been crying over the wrong stuff. Come on, or not crying at all. Or not crying over the things that break God's heart. Come on, wave at me. I want to know who I'm praying for. Who's in the room today and you're saying, you know what? There's some selfishness in me. 
I got to die to my preferences. I got to die to myself so that I can actually become the fruitful person that God wants me to be. Come on, wave at me. I want to pray for you. Wave at me. I want to pray for you. God, I thank you for my friends, my brothers, and my sisters in Urbandale, Iowa. God, we pray for new hope. God, we thank you for every believer with their hand raised right now. God, I ask that you would do what no guest speaker can do, that you would take the seed of your word, and that, Lord God, it would multiply 30, 60, and 100 fold. God, we thank you that you're going to give us new eyes to see the Leah's in our life, not as unattractive or ugly, but as things that are going to produce fruit in our life. God, we thank you for everyone that needs to have a better reign on their tongue. God, we thank you for everyone that needs to uh, begin to not cry over the things that don't break your heart. And God, ultimately, for those of us who need to give ourselves, who need to sow ourselves, God, we ask that right now that you would do something in our hearts and in our minds that would help us go from desire to implementation. God, we thank you that throughout the course of this week, tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, you're going to meet us here. And God, we thank you that we're going to be better, stronger, wiser, and more full of your spirit by this time next week than we are right now. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Come on, and we all said amen. amen. Come on, we all said amen. amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, church, I'm really excited to be with you all week. Who's coming back tonight? Come on, who's coming back tonight? I'll, I'll give uh, the last two forms of seed tonight. Um, and I'm really excited to be with you all week. Really quick, I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Jeff, and we're going to dismiss. A uh, couple years ago, two years ago, actually, I started a ministry called ARMA, A-R-M-A, -A, uh, where I teach Bible courses. And so every month, we release about a two- to three-hour-long Bible course. Sometimes I teach a book of the Bible, like 1 Corinthians, Deuteronomy, Ephesians. Those are examples of the courses that we have on the platform. It's like Netflix, but for the Bible. Uh, and... Uh, one of the courses that is one of our highly watched courses is our course on homosexuality. If you're a Christian, I think that you need to understand like what God's word says about all topics, you know? And so uh, we release a new course every single month. If that's something that you're interested in, um, it's really inexpensive. It's like less than, I think it's like 15 bucks a month based on what subscription you do. But I'd love to teach you the Bible. I'd love to do that. 